Mm -hmm. uh, for the Q&A, we should turn off our um, camera for the other presenter or not? Um, it's up. Uh, yeah, I think I'll say that. I think uh, it would be good for us to keep our cameras off while people are presenting. Um, but um, for the other contestants, the participants don't have the ability to turn their cameras on. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Also, In I have a question. Yeah. Before we what's start. up? Uh, yeah. How the voting will work? Uh, for the people's choice? Um, I'm going to do a poll in Teams. So okay. everyone will access it, and then we can then display live who wins <laughs> through the polls on Teams. Thank you. Yeah? OK. Slide show. OK, so welcome to Webinars Worth Watching, our 2024 version. Um, we're going to start out with a quick introduction. So this competition was started um, actually pre-COVID with a collaboration between the UNCG Graduate School and University Libraries. And Greg Bell helped start, found this competition, the Dean of the Grad School, and he could make it today. So Greg, do you have any comments? Sure, I'll just take a couple of minutes. I know that we don't have a whole lot of time. So um, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that, that you're all here and participating in this event. Uh, as Sam mentioned, this was a collaborative event that we started before COVID, before we had any idea that the webinars would be as important as they are now. Um, uh, but it's, it's an exciting format, and it's a format that I think um, is here to stay. Um, it's also a format that um, is important to me because it allows students to participate uh, from wherever they are. Um, uh, so graduate students from across the, the, the nation, really across the world, can participate in this, uh, in this research competition. Um, so for me, um, it's just the best of, of all worlds. I'm really excited to see what you all have uh, for us today. I'll turn it back to Sam. Thanks. Thank you. So yeah, as Greg said, we started this competition years ago. Um, my name is Sam Harlow, my pronouns are she, hers, and I'm the online learning librarian as well as a research liaison librarian, so I work with academic departments as well. And yeah, this was created online before, um, like Greg said, <laughs> COVID, um, when we were thinking about how can we have online students in particular participate and be able to showcase their research. And as Greg mentioned, uh, we never could have even thought of how relevant online presenting would become. So even, be even before the world was the way it is now, um, online presenting is important because of accessibility. Um, so I think it's important in terms of especially research, because our research at UNCG and at many universities is global. So it's important to think through how your research can be accessible to not only your peers within academia, but a wide variety of audiences. So we came up with this idea uh, modeled after the idea of three minute thesis, which is an in-person competition to give people a little more space, a little more slides um, to be able to present their research to a general audience. So there are rules. A slide presentation is permitted, but no more than 10 slides, including your title slide and credits. Webinars are limited to 10 minutes maximum. I will time it on my end. And if you exceed 10 minutes, you are disqualified. We have done a preliminary round, and these are the contestants, the top four contestants that came out of that preliminary round. Uh, so they do know the rules, and they have practiced uh, repeatedly within this format. They are spoken words, so no poetry, raps, or songs, and also no props. Webinars are considered to have started when a presenter starts speaking. Um, and again, I will be the timer on my end. The presenters will get a one minute warning in chat, but not verbally. Um, so participants cannot turn their cameras or their mics on, and that is on purpose. We have also turned off the notification when people enter or leave the rooms uh, in order for the presenters to be able to concentrate. Um, so we do not, we also ask you to not use the chat unless they ask you to participate, um, but uh, to try to avoid that as well. But they, we want to keep that chat as free as possible so that they see the one minute warning. There is a rubric. Uh, we have three judges that I'm about to introduce in a little bit um, that are following this rubric. So they will be scoring on their end and then they will be emailing me the scores and you will hear about a winner today. We have a first place winner that receives $300, the second place winner receives $200, and there is a people's choice that everyone in this room, in this virtual space, can vote on, um, and they receive $100. It, the people's choice could be the same as the first or the second um, winner, um, so keep that in mind. Uh, that does not matter. 
We will be using Teams polls, so everyone should be able to access it, but you will need to be in the room when we do the poll at the end. Um, so if you have to leave early, you will not be able to vote. Uh, so more about this competition, including past winners, past competitions, um, as well as all the links to everything is on the website, which is listed here, as well as at go.uncg.edu slash www. So I just want to thank our preliminary judges. We had three rounds of preliminaries earlier this week, um, and here they are. Jenny Dale from the libraries, Sarah Danes, a professor of sociology here at UNCG, and Amanda Shipman from Information Technology Services, working with our learning management system and team lead. So I want to thank our finalist judges who are here today who will be uh, scoring our contestants. Pam Brown, UNCG Kinesiology, who is the program EDD director. Amy harris halk from UNCG Libraries, the Assistant Dean of Teaching and Learning, and Mara Hines, the UNCG Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, as well as a Professor of Classical Studies. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge them. This is um, really important work and uh, it goes beyond uh, the research side of things. It's also about student success. So thank you a lot. Okay. so. Without further ado, and don't worry, we will take a breath and I will stop sharing my screen and give Parth plenty of time, but we have Parth Desai, who's going to be talking first about evaluating immune cell-based approach for breast cancer immunotherapy. Okay, stop sharing, come back in here. Okay, so Nushin, can you take your hand down or do you have another question before we um, have Hard go. Oh, sorry, I forgot to remove it. Oh, that's fine. I just want to make sure that's it's not up. Now? What? It's removed now. It's removed now. Out. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And just give me a second. Um. Okay. And I'm sorry, I misspelled Mara's name in the PowerPoint, and that is my bad. Um, Mara, I don't. Okay. So I'm going to make Mara a presenter in case she needs to signal me. Um, that's our uh, guest. Okay. Um, Mara, can you turn your camera on now? Just to make sure you're here. Great. Okay, I see you. Okay, so we do ask that um, judges and other contestants keep their cameras off during this competition. Um, I'm going to get my timer out, and if, part, if you want to start sharing your screen, I will get my Walk out. Yeah. Can you can you see my screen? No. Wait. Not yet. Sometimes it is no. a little delayed. No. Can you see it? I can. So it's not in presenter mode yet. No. Okay. Yes. So I am going to mute myself and turn my camera off. And remember <clears throat> from the preliminaries, same deal. You can take a breath, whatever you need to do. And then when you start speaking, I will time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Uh, greetings, everybody. Because I don't know what part of world you are watching me today in the webinar. My name is Part Desai. I'm a fourth year nanoscience PhD candidate at University of North Carolina, Greensboro, Department of Nanoscience at the Joint School of Na Nanoscience and Nanoengineering. Today, I'm very much excited to share about my research with you, which explores the immune cell based cancer therapeutic approach against breast cancer. You might have somebody or you might have a loved one or have a loved one who suffered from breast cancer. Every two minutes, there is one woman being diagnosed with the breast cancer. By the time I finish my webinar today, there will be five new women being diagnosed with the breast cancer. Moreover, according to the UNC's public health report, the cases are increased by 54.8% between 2015 and 2030. Not only more people are being diagnosed with the breast cancer, but breast cancer itself a very complex disease, which has four different types, as you see on the screen, namely human epidermal growth factor, progesterone receptor positive, estrogen receptor positive, and triple negative breast cancer. Now, what are the receptors? Receptors are nothing but the crown on the head of the cancer cell that we can identify them with their names. Like we have our names, they also have their names. 
Among these four types, HER2 and triple negative are highly invasive and they have highest number of deaths among the women so far in the world. There are few types of therapeutics approach available in the clinics nowadays, which includes surgery, radiation and chemotherapy for breast cancer. But still, there are some challenges are associated with these therapies. If we talk about chemotherapy, chemotherapy is nothing but a chemically synthesized drugs which is given to a patient. This drug is not specific to the cancer and it cannot identify cancer cell versus healthy cell because cancer cells are evolved from the healthy cells. Moreover, the same chemotherapeutic drugs will not be effective after few or more rounds of dosages and that is called chemo resistance. That means it is resisted now. It cannot be effective anymore. The second is the surgery where doctors can remove the tumor mass, but there are still some residues are left behind and patients can have tumor again in their lifespan. Moreover, the radiation therapy has some side effects associated with it after the treatment. We are living in the era of cancer immunotherapy. As its name indicates, cancer immunotherapy, that means it takes the advantage of our own immune system to fight against the cancer. And it has the least potential side effects. There are two types of cancer immunotherapy. One is immune checkpoint inhibitors. What does it do? It locks the cancer specific protein on cancer cell using an antibody. Why? The second one is the adaptive cellular therapy. That means patients own immune cells are taken out of the body and they are modulated or engineered to identify the cancer specific protein and kill them with the cancer cell. Now, these two therapies are widely available, but they are still under evaluation against the breast cancer. There are still some challenges with this therapy as they are very new. First is the cost, which costs around 400,000 USD today. There is a limited use of this adaptive cellular therapy, which is against only blood cancer, not with the breast cancer. And it is very time consuming. That means the immune cells taken out of the patient and engineered outside of the body and put them back. The whole procedure takes three to four weeks of time and it takes a longer time for a patient to receive the therapy. Now, I have established the need or the urgency for the better breast cancer treatment and the potential of immunotherapy. Here is my approach comes into the picture. My approach is not only a hope for the breast cancer patients, but also opens the new avenue in the field of cancer immunotherapy, which will be more cost effective and with the least side effects. Immune cell-based cancer immunotherapy, I have two approaches. One is cell-based approach, where I use immune cells, we call them mast cells. Mast cells, here you see in the figure, they are combined with the antibody that can identify the cancer specific protein on the breast cancer cell. After combining mast cells with the antibody that can recognize the breast cancer, it will attack the breast cancer with, by releasing the anti-cancer proteins and it will kill the breast cancer cell. The second approach here as you see is the biomolecule based approach or biological molecule based approach where we are using extracellular particles. These particles are not synthesized by us, but they are taken or generated by the immune cells and we collected them, hoping that these particles will carry some anti-cancer specific protein in their sex or bag. Now, I took these extracellular particles and checked their effectiveness against breast cancer. Let me share some results with you. You are seeing a small video which indicates the mast cell based approach, which I talk about very first, where you see the big orange cells are the breast cancer cells and tiny pink cells are the mast cells. 
Remember, the antibody that recognizes the breast cancer cells, it helps these mast cells to, rec to identify the breast cancer cells and attack them. As they are attacked, they are killed by the mast cells, which are immune cells, and they turn into the green color. This green color indicates that breast cancers are killed by the mast cells. Another approach is extracellular particle-based approach, where you see on the left side of the screen, where you see the green color or the blue color, which are the breast cancer cells. And on the bottom part, you see the tiny, tiny particles around the breast cancer cells. As I said, I took those extracellular particles and put it with the breast cancer cells so to see their effectiveness. After 48 hours of time, when I see these blue cells turned into the green cells, the green color indicates the damage. Okay, so it's frozen. I don't know if Parth can hear me. It does not happen, so I did stop the clock. We will get a second. Okay, so I wrote to Parth, and what I'll do is, for the sake of time, um, I think. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go next, and I'm going to write Parth, and we're going to have him go again. Um, judges, if are y'all available for a little bit past three, if this goes a little bit past three now? from Amy. Bam. Okay. Okay. So, um, I would ask the judges just in case to, to make some notes. And again, hopefully we can get Parth back in. Is Nabila for us? from Geography, Environment, and Sustainability on Immigrants and Inequality in the Greensboro High Point Metropolitan Area, Metro Area. I have a problem with that word, I always say. I mess it up. It's my fault. So, Nabila, can you start sharing your screen? Yes. Can you guys see? I can, and it is in presenter mode. Okay, same deal. I'm going to <clears throat> mute and turn my camera off. Okay. And you just, when you're ready. Hi, everyone. My name is Nabila Farhat, and today I will be presenting to you my research on immigrants and inequality in Greensboro High Point metropolitan area. More than 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement, we still have racial inequalities happening in social, political, and economic systems within the United States. Quality of life is better for those that have higher levels of income because it positively correlates with better health, better levels of education, and a more developed social community. However, ne uh, poverty um, negatively affects the housing choices, access to resources such as health care, and unfortunately, large shares of minorities, African American, Hispanics, and women, and immigrants remain overrepresented in this less affluent portion of income distribution. Now, cities which have historically had a large foreign-born and immigrant population, those two terms I use interchangeably, have been cities like New York or San Francisco or areas in Texas. However, places like Greensboro and Charlotte are becoming more popular with the foreign-born population. And these areas Within these areas, we are seeing more concentrations of minorities we often know as enclaves. And these areas help immigrants pull together their resources, integrate into the labor market and the broader society. So they're seen as mobile, as mobile machines. And we see these areas such as 
um, Chinatowns and Little Italy in our specific area, uh, the area of GMARC. And these areas help um, establish networks and businesses. However, these areas are also known as mobile traps because they disadvantage these groups and because these groups are unable to become proficient in English, face restriction in the housing market and employment opportunities. Lastly, the role of geography as a geographer, right, is very important when looking at dimensions of inequality because industries, occupation, and people are all geographically unevenly divided. So my research is to look at, so how are the socioeconomic and housing characteristics varying among immigrants and the U.S.-born white and black population within my metro area? And to what extent are these inequality patterns um, available or existent in geographically overrepresented and underrepresented neighborhoods? Again, my metro area is Greensboro High Point metropolitan area. It is a small to mid-sized metropolitan area, the third largest after Charlotte and Raleigh. And with the exception of Guilford County, the other two counties, Rockingham and Randolph, are rural. And this area saw an influx of skilled and unskilled immigrant workers in the early 1900s, mainly due to the agricultural, manufacturing, and construction service jobs available within this area. Now, um, the... Uh, the metropolitan area has approximately 9% of foreign-born populations, and of that group, we see Latin Americans having the highest share, followed by Asians, Africans, and Europeans. For my methods, I use a location quotient, which is basically to look at where foreign-borns, Blacks, and Whites are living. So you're just going to be seeing a clustering of populations within neighborhoods. On the other hand, to see income distribution and income inequality, we uh, I use Lorenz curve and Gini coefficient, which basically plot out the richest to the poorest income distribution for each of the population on a graph as seen. So this is the LQ values displayed on a map. And so uh, when you're looking at this, you see that the, the darkest color means that there's a large concentration of that um, population within this area. So looking at immigrant concentrations, we see that immigrants are mainly within this um, southwestern, western area of Guilford County, proximate to the PTI airport. But we also see some um, clustering of immigrants within this northeastern side headed into this Rockingham County as well. So a large portion of immigrants are living outside of that city boundary of both High Point and Greensboro and um, Rockingham County, with the exception of Ashboro, which is right into the inner city areas. In um, when we are comparing the immigrant populations with the white and black populations, we are seeing that immigrant populations are four times more likely to live with black population than whites. Now, when we are looking at, of course, each of those and comparing them, we see that where black, uh, where um, immigrants and whites are living together, it is mainly in that um, suburban area, such as Oak Ridge and South uh, Summerfield and Pleasant Garden. In terms of segregation among the three groups, we see that Blacks are facing the most segregation, if you can just look at the concentrations of them um, compared to the other two groups. And in fact, they're most um, segregated from whites, but it, when there is a higher clustering, so higher clustering of 1.76 and more, they are, seg they are segregated from all groups within that metropolitan area. So this is the Lorenz curve that shows the inequality between the three groups. And what this shows is that the top 5% of foreign-born groups earn more than 95% of income. What this means is that the richest um, foreign-born groups in the higher socioeconomic statuses, for example, are earning more than 95% of the income, so 150 plus. But the lower groups are earning probably less than 10,000, so a huge income disparity between those two groups. Next, when we're comparing the three groups, we see that Blacks are facing the highest income inequality because of the high Gini coefficient at 0 0.4, followed by immigrants at 0 0.19. And lastly, Whites are facing the least amount of inequality, but also they have the highest earning of all population groups within the metro area. 
overall patterns of the Gini coefficient is showing that 20 to 80 percent of blacks are facing the greatest income inequality, whether that is in areas where they are highly clustered or in areas where there's not a lot of blacks to begin with. Now, education and English proficiency in relation to spatial distribution show that um, immigrant enclave areas have lower levels of education and lower English proficiency. While areas or neighborhoods with less clustering of foreign-born groups have higher education, and sometimes that is um, the lowest amount is a, a bachelor's degree, while um, uh, and then also higher levels of English proficiency. Areas um, with blacks and uh, foreign-born groups housing characteristics show that they have more, they are more likely to live in areas with two to three bedroom housing while whites have more variability in housing characteristics. And mainly again, that is because when we're comparing it with the income distributions, they're earning a higher income, so less financial constraints, and they're, so they're able to choose more um, freely their housing attributes. Now, we don't see significance in necessities such as phone, kitchen, plumbing, or even transportation within the, uh, uh, within the metropolitan area being con um, major factors of inequality. Lastly, within the metropolitan areas, our results overall are showing that higher socioeconomic status individuals are living outside the periphery of the city, so those suburban areas. While in areas where there is high poverty, unfortunately, there is a, lot, a, a high number of African Americans and um, foreign-born groups suffering from that inequality as well. Foreign-born groups are not within the lower incomes, they're more of the low middle income, um, but areas that have those ethnic enclaves do have lower levels of income. Um, la the two main factors that we see that are influencing foreign-born um, location choices in particular are in, um, English proficiency and education levels. And lastly, segregation, inequality, and among all groups is an ongoing urban process, and it cannot be separated from institutional forces, historical residential patterns, and history of redlining, which is especially evident in the historical uh, which is especially evident with the um, African American patterns of living, which directly reflect the redlining patterns that have happened in Greensboro. Now, why is this research important? One of the main reasons this is important is that policy and urban planners can take this and get a clear picture of demographic and geographic trends around the metropolitan area. And they can use it to make specific inclusive policies um, for specific groups and invest in infrastructure to promote equal opportunities and inclusive regional um, economic growth for all groups. Thank you so much for listening. You're getting applause. Good job. Um, so the yeah. judges, take a moment and... Um, Write your notes and score, um, and while we are waiting, um, I do, I think what we should do is that um, Parth is back, um, and so can I talk to Parth real fast, Lindsay, before you share your screen, and let's see, um, okay, so you froze at eight minutes, do you feel like you could start at the beginning of that slide with two images? Or what would make you feel comfortable in terms of being able to finish your presentation? Uh, so thank you so much, first of all, for reconsidering because it was an, int I don't know what happened while I was presenting. It's okay. I mean, again, we want you to be <laughs> able to finish it and, um, yes. you know, in the time. Um, so I think, you know, if you feel comfortable, you could just take a breath and start at the beginning of that slide with two images, and I'll time you and give you like three more minutes, which means that gives you come kind of, you know, I think you'll be fine. You know, I think the timing will still be fair to the other contestants. Does that <coughs> sound fair? Yeah. Or, uh, should I start it again from the back? Yeah. So if what? you don't mind sharing, um, are the other judges okay to view? 
Are y'all done scoring Nabila? And then we can see Parth. Okay, Amy said she's ready. Pam said yes. Let's just give Mara a second. Yes, okay. So when you're ready, you share. You were on the screen with after the video of the two images. Okay, sure. And uh, uh, I will stop froze at eight minutes. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I'll fine. time. And if it, you know, again, I think just to give you space, I'll let it go a little, you know, a little over two minutes. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank if, you. So if you want to start at the beginning of that slide to make sure you got that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, I'm not for seeing your me. slides yet. Yes. Just a second. It's right okay. over here now. And it's in the presenter mode. Is it now it's good? Yes. So everything worked well in the video, right? Yes. yes. We were on this slide. Mm -hmm. Pros. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you can time me now. Oh. So the, uh, the extracellular particle based approach, as you see the mass cell based approach, now this is the second approach. Uh, as you see in the blue color, there are breast cancer cells. And on the slide down here, you see those small tiny line, that's uh, extracellular particles combined on the breast cancer cell. And they are interacting with the breast cancer cell. And I was studying this effect and the interaction. What I found was these breast cancer cells from the blue turn into the green in color. The green color indicates that cancer cells are dying. And that was my hypothesis was to identify that what is the effect of these extracellular particles which has anti-cancer proteins on the breast cancer. And we found that these particles were able to kill the breast cancer cells. I would like to thank Nanobio Innovation Lab at the Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering for giving me a space and a lab equipment to conduct these projects. UNCG Graduate School and University Libraries, Department of Nanoscience, and the judges and the audience who took their valuable time to coming here and listen to me and providing me a platform like a webinar. And I would like to tell that with this research, we have showcased a breast cancer possibility in the treatment and also we hope that this will be taken further by other research scientists. And uh, as a scientist, my duty was to add value to the society and I want to keep continuing uh, and uh, contributing to the research and bringing more innovation and helping patients in their uh, best life. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So for the judges to understand, he would not have gone over um, the 10 minutes. He was heading towards the end. So in terms of the timing, you're fine. Thank you. That's fair. And uh, we will ignore the technical issue. It happens to everyone. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Okay. So as the judges are scoring Parth, we ask that you turn your camera off and mute. And Lindsay, you can now get ready to go. Well, let me, let me introduce you. Let me be fair and uh, do the same thing I've been doing to everyone here. Uh, okay, so I know it's in like slide mode, but just for sake of time, here is Lindsay Jarvis from Psychology, MA Experimental Psychology, and she will be talking about differences in nature conversations across rural and urban children. Okay, so when you're ready, um, let me confirm with the judges. Are y'all done um, scoring art? And uh, as Lindsay gets, Lindsay, you can start sharing whenever, but I'll make sure that the judges are ready before I time you. <clears throat> okay, Mara's good, Pam's good. And you see my slide fine. I do. Okay. So let's make sure, okay, Amy's good. Okay, same deal. I am going to mute myself and turn my camera off. And when you start speaking is when you will be timed. Thank you. All right, hi, my name is Lindsay Jarvis and I'm a master's student in experimental psychology in the Department of Psychology. And I'll be presenting on a section of my thesis data today titled Differences in Nature Conversations Across Rural and Urban Children. So 
So over time, the way that humans have interacted with nature has changed. We were once a hunter-gatherer society. Oops, sorry. Uh, we were once a hunter-gatherer society constantly dependent on nature for our everyday survival. Yet today, farmers make up less than 1% of Americans, and it's even more likely for an individual to be incarcerated than to be a farmer. And those who are farmers are interacting with nature through parallel means of commercial machinery. And all these differences of how people are interacting with nature are due to urbanization. Increased urbanization has led to differences across communities' ability to have access to nature. We're seeing this across rural, suburban, and urban areas. And this has led to my research question of how does region of living, that is rural versus urban, impact children's understanding of ecological food chains? For my study, I recruited 92 children between the ages of 4 to 6 from North Carolina, both in rural and urban areas. To be in a rural area of North Carolina, seen in yellow here on the map of North Carolina, children had to be from a zip code that was from an Appalachian County and have a population density of less than 500 people per square mile. To be from an urban area of North Carolina, people, uh, children had to be living in a zip code that was outside of an Appalachian region and have a zip code of greater than 700 people per square mile. In this study, I taught children how to make and justify two three-element food chains, seen here. I showed them how to put them in the correct order, so assembling them, and how to justify them correctly by bunny eats carrots and fox eats bunny. I then gave children these three four-element food chains and asked them to assemble and justify them. So I tested children's assembly and justification of food chains. I found that rural children were better than urban children on justifying food chains, but there was no difference between urban and rural children's ability to assemble food chains. I also asked parents questions related to children's nature exposure. So I first asked, how many hours a week does your child spend outdoors? And I found that there was no difference between rural and urban children's time spent outside. For the next two questions, you can see parents' frequencies of responses on table one here. So then I asked, how often do you talk about nature with your child? So here are the rural parents' responses and the urban parents' responses for this question on the scale of never up to daily. I found that there was more frequency of rural parents reported more frequency of nature talk compared to urban parents. I then asked, what type of outdoor exposure is near your residency? So we have the different types of outdoor exposures from least exposure to the greatest amount of outdoor exposure being woods and farms, rural parents' responses, and urban parent responses. And here I found that rural parents were more likely to report having woods and farmland outdoor exposure compared to urban parents who were more likely to report having parks as their outdoor exposure. So I wanted to paint this picture a little bit more based off of the data that I received. So the most frequent zip code I received for my urban area was Greensboro, particularly this area towards the airport. And my most frequent rural zip code I received was King, North Carolina. So King is located northwest of Winston-Salem, heading toward the Virginia border, and it's about an hour from this location of Greensboro. So here's some data provided by the United States Postal Service from 2020, looking at the differences between these zip codes. And we're seeing some stereotypical differences of the urban area has a higher population, greater population density, more housing units, and income compared to the rural area. But let's take a look at these places with more of a bird's eye view to see what they really look like. So this is the Greensboro area, and this is the King area. And we're seeing exactly what parents reported, that the Greensboro area, their outdoor exposure is most likely parks, particularly this area around this lake. And then also for the King area, the outdoor exposure we're seeing is woodlands and farms. But I decided to take a step further and look to see if there might be differences in the types of parks in these places. So for my Greensboro area, I looked at Burr Mill Park. And for my rural area, I work, looked at the recreational acres in King, North Carolina. So these are some pictures of these two places. And this is when it gets to be really interesting, and we're seeing that there's not much difference between the exposure of nature between the urban and rural areas of North Carolina. They both still have these playgrounds. They have grassy areas 
wooded trails, and they both have a lake. So how can rural children be better at justifying food chains if they're receiving the same amount of nature exposure as urban children? Well, I think this is when it gets to be really interesting because I saw a big difference between rural children's justifications based off of the anecdotal evidence that they provided for reasonings to be afraid from conversations that they had had with their parents. Rural children's responses and their justification, so after providing a correct justification, they were more often to include fear and safety-based commandments. Here's some examples. We saw things like coyotes live on the ground and eat people. Coyotes hunt down kids. My friend got bit by a coyote. These responses would be provided after a correct justification, and I did not have any anecdotal explanations like this provided by urban children, only rural children. So it could be that the differences in nature exposure between rural and urban residences is not leading to differences in frequency of nature talk, but rather the type of nature talk. So I'm going to wrap up with some elements that I included in my study that were new and my major takeaways. My um, study was the first one that allowed children to create and justify their own food chains. Previous researchers have given children pre-done correct food chains and asked them why they were correct. I decided to take a step back further and say, can children even correctly put together a food chain themselves? I found that they were and that there was no difference between rural and urban children, but rural children are better at justifying food chains. I was the first researcher to use realistic photographs. Previous researchers have used 3D models, drawings, and cartoons. And not only did I use realistic photographs, I used them, uh, organisms that were native to the biome of North Carolina that would be familiar to both rural and urban children. I was the first researcher to assess children's exposure to nature. Previous researchers have just said that rural children have increased exposure to nature because they live in a rural area compared to urban children. I actually asked research questions about this, and I found that there was no difference between the time spent outside, frequency of nature talk, which I'm glad I asked these questions because I realized the difference is really starting to be the type of nature conversations. But to this is very much a further direction for future researchers because we need to study this more to be sure that this is the cause. So my research question was aimed to examine how regional living rural versus urban, might be impacting children's understanding of ecological food chains. We know that urbanization is leading to the destruction of nature, but we need to know how children's are, children understand nature so that we can be teaching them the best way. We need children to care intrinsically about nature for them to enact future change and make differences in our future society's conservation efforts. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me today, and um, I just want to thank my family and friends and my lab and my thesis committee members for supporting me and my research. Okay, you're at 8 minutes, 38 seconds. So the judges will be scoring. And we do have another contestant. So do you want to start sharing, Nushin? Yes, I do. And uh, judges, when you are ready with your scoring and notes, please let me know in the chat. I can see you. I can see your screen. Yep. One, two. Okay, now it's on Teams. You want to go back to the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Okay, it is in present mode. Yes, it's in present mode. Yes, you look great, and I will um, turn my camera off, mute. When you're ready, start. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Nushin Kiyomashiron. I'm a PhD student of nanoscience from Junju School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering. Today I want to talk about a big problem that we have in the hospital, that it happened for the patient, especially for the patient, they have a problem with their immune system. 
response and they got the medication, antifungal medication for a long time and drug resistance happened for them and how we can use nanoscience to solve this problem. Normally fungus cells live in our body no matter in our mouth, nose, ears, lungs, skin, everywhere. But they can make any disease or any problem for us because our immune system finds them. So if they start to change anything about their behavior or their appearance, our immune system cells recognize it, go to that place, catch them, and kill them. So nothing happened for us. But, but for some special patients, like um, cancer patients, that because of the medication they got for a long time, their immune system can respond the same as us. Also in the patient who had a transplant surgery, or they have an autoimmune system disease, because of the medication they got to suppress their immune system response, they can't react uh, as well as us. So it can make a problem for them. For this problem, we have several kind of antifungal medication. If it happens around or on the nail, we have some kind of oil and nail polish that we can use to treat the fungus. Also, if it happens on the skin, we have several kind of ointment, cream, and lotion that we can use it. Also, there are some kind of soap that we can wash the skin and treat that fungus. Hey, Nushin, your screen is frozen. I stopped the clock. Um, so if you want to try to move your slideshow. Okay. Why it's on the first, it's on the first slide. Oh, wait. So I should, you can see I close my uh, presentation, my slide. No. Okay. I stop sharing and share again. Yeah, let's try that. Can you see my screen now? Let's wait a second. Now is antifungal medication slide. I'm I'm seeing a blank screen, but let's just give it a second. Okay. You want to try sharing again? Yeah. Can you see now? Can you see my slide? No. Can other people see it? No other people can't see it. It's just a blank space. Oh, what I should do? Should they go um, out and come back or? Yeah, why don't we try that? Okay, I, I will come back. So, um, the way we're doing people's choice is a poll. Um, and I feel like, to be fair, I have to do it after everyone presents. Um, so if you want to vote in People's Choice, hopefully you can stay a little bit past three. Um, and we'll do it that way. I have a form as a backup as well. So try that. We need to. Hi, I come back. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Let's go. People. Can you see my slide? No. Can you see it? No. Or no. Um, trying to think. Are you on your browser? Yes. I tried to download it, but it doesn't work in my laptop. I don't know what's wrong. Uh-huh. Um, can you try a 
to leave and come back on a different browser? You can see yeah. it now. Do you want to send me your slides? Okay. Maybe we'll do it that way. Did you send it? Did she leave? Hi, I came with you from there. Okay, I can see you better now. You want to try sharing your screen or emailing them to me? Can you see my slide now? Yes. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> so you saw this slide. You didn't see until phone goes. No, we all we were on the first slide. So I mean, I think we're going to be over time anyway. So I don't, you were only a minute and a half in when I stopped it. Is, is everyone okay with her just starting from the beginning? Just because it was a minute and a half and I don't feel like that's worth saving the time. Okay, the judges are saying yes. Um, so let's just so do I that. Start from the first. Is that okay? Yeah, it's better. And I'll just Thank start you. the timer over. I think it's not worth saving the minute. Um, okay. You know, so that's what we'll do. Um, so present mode. Go forward a slide. Sorry? Go forward a slide. Let's make sure that's working before I turn my stuff off. Yep. Okay. Is Go back. Working? Yep. Okay. Okay. Go back and okay. I will mute and turn my camera off and we'll start. Um, and please everyone, if you could stay, the minute this is over is when I will release the people's choice. Um, if you can't, I put my email in the chat and um, we can do some other things, but I think I think the best thing is just going to be to stay. Okay, camera off, muted, and Nushin, you start when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Nushin Kiyashrad. I'm a PhD student of nanoscience from Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering. Today, I want to talk about the big problem that we have in the hospital, especially for the patient who had a problem with their immune system response and they should get uh, antifungal medication for a long time and drug resistance happen for them and how we can use nanoscience to solve that problem. Fungus cells normally can live in our body no matter in which part of our body. They can live in our mouth, nose, ear, lung, skin, everywhere, but they can make any disease for us. Because if they start to change the behavior or their shape, our immune system recognizes it, go to that place, catch them, and kill them. But in some special patient, like cancer patient, because of the medication they get for a long time, their immune system can't respond the same as us. Also, in the uh, patient who had a transplant surgery, or they have an autoimmune system disease, because, of, uh, because the physician gave them uh, there are um, some medication to suppress their immune system response so they, they can't respond the same as us. So it makes them to be sick and then make some problem for them. For this problem, we have some kind of medication. If it happens on the nail or around the nail, we have some oil and uh, nail polish that we can use it to treat it. If it happens on skin, there are different kind of medication on the cream, lotion, uh, ointment that we can use to treat it. And also there are some uh, soap that we can wash the skin to uh, treat for treatment. But if it happened inside of the body, for example, in our lung or in our um, stomach, there are uh, different pills or capsules that a physician can order for us and we can take it for sometimes to treat it, but sometimes it go through the whole body and make a systemic disease infection in our body. So in that time, physician request us to get the antifungal injection. 
but there are several problems to using this kind of medication. At first, in the patient's side, when the patient get it for a long time, uh, they get diarrhea, stomachache, joint pain, continuous headache, and if they use it as a topical use, it makes itchy or rashes or redness happen in that part of the skin. On the pharmaceutical part, we have a problem that we call it biofilm formation. Normal yeast cells is like the same of the oval shape, but after a while, when they want to get pathogenic, they start to make a head in one side of their cells. So in that side, if our immune system can work well, recognize it and kill that cells. But in otherwise, in the patient, they have a lower response of the immune system, that um, yeast um, get a chance to get a pathogenic. They start to make a filament like a tail, like here that I showed you, that I show you. And after a while, all of the cells in that part start to have a, a be, make a big tail for themselves. And they start to insert that tail inside of the tissue, no matter it's happened on your skin or inside of the body, maybe in long river or anywhere else. And when they have enough time to make it mature and big enough, they completely fix on the tissue. And then they start to make a new yeast cells. And then that yeast cell can transfer to other, uh, other part of the body. Sometimes it's from this part of the skin go to the next part of the skin. But sometimes they can go through the bloodstream and go to other organs in the body and make a systemic, systemic disease. In our lab, we make very tiny structure that I, that I can show here. And then uh, we start to culture the normal yeast cell on top of it. After a while, we found some of the yeast cell are ruptured and dead, but some of them are still alive. We found something more than just the appearance of that tiny structure. We make change their uh, cell wall and rupture happen for them. It means something inside of the cell change, the behavior of the cell change, and then they, 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 the death happen for them. We have some special microscope in our lab that we can see very tiny uh, structure. As I, uh, as I can show here, in these cells are rupture and dead completely, like here. But some of them, like this one, this one, and they are, are still alive. So we want to find the best way to do that for all yeast cells. In my project, we chose pan nanofiber. Nanofiber is very close to your coats that you wear now, but they made from very tiny fiber, not normal fiber. We chose that because we can load the medication between the layers and then the drug can come out by a step by a step. When it's happened, we can have a control release and there is no problem to make measure uh, uh, about the, uh, how much the medication release in each step. And we don't need to use medication over and over. And also, also we can use it as a, a patch or bandage for wound dressing to treat the, any kind of wound better than before. And also we can make it like a, a scaffold and help cells to regenerate the damaged tissue. And for making a fiber, we need to use the polymer. We chose PAN. PAN means polyacrylate nitrate. Why we chose it? Because it's a hydrophilic polymer. Our body made from 70% water, so it's a good factor for us. The second one is this polymer has a good chemical resistance, so we don't need, we are not in a rush when we made it. We are not in a rush to use it as soon as possible. We can make it now, and any time we want to use it, we can use it. Also, it says it's cheap. So in the future, when we want to make a huge amount of it, we don't have any worriness. And also, it has an excellent possibility, possibility for making nanofiber. It's my result. We, I focus on two time, 30 minutes and two hours. Why? Because anything around the yeast cell start to change. The yeast cell start to change their behavior after 30 minutes. And after two hours, they start to get pathogenic and start to make that tail for themselves. So I focus on these two times. And we found some of when we use the nano size of the fiber, some of the genes express more or less than normal. What's the meaning of that? Some of the genes 
act like a food for the cell. So we want to find how many of that genes act like a food, express or produce less than normal, that I um, showed with the blue color here, and how many of uh, the genes that act like a poison. So it's good for us to increase more, uh, produce more in the cells, and then because if they get the yeast cell to be poisony, they, uh, they help us to kill the yeast cells. So we focus on these uh, genes to find how many of them express more and how many of the genes act like a food express uh, lower than normal. But when we check all of the data and analyze all of the data we found, some of them happen just because of the tiny structure we made, but some of them just in the same group, in the same, uh, when, when we just use the uh, nano uh, powder of that polymer. So we found some of them just happen because of the polymer, but some of them happen because of the nanofiber we made it. And if in the future we can validate in the next step our analysis, we can use it in different fields. For example, we can make a new um, bandage or coverage for different kind of wound, or also we can cover the instrument that we use in the hospital or maybe whole room of the that kind of special patient to cover anything for them so that nanofiber can make a, uh, act like a barrier between the patient and the yeast cells so there is no the, the yeast can't go through the body or uh, in, we, in that way we can decrease the chance of exposure to yeast cells also we can use as a um, um, hospital dress for the patient and also we can use that polymer as a nanostructure, like a nano powder, uh, and add to the medication that normally we use in the pills or capsule, and in that way we can increase the efficacy of the medication. Thank you for your attention. He is my advisor, Dr. Lajanis, and they are my colleagues. Thank you. Great job. You're getting uh, things. Okay, so I'm going to release the poll because I know we're a little over time. So here we go. And judges, you can um, be emailing me at that email address, and y'all all have my email. So here you go. Let me just check it one more time to make sure everyone's in here. In the order of what they did. Okay, this is our people's choice. So pick your favorite. Contestants, I think you should be able to use it. Uh, you can send me just the numbers, Mara, um, in email, not in the chat, and I'll add them up. And again, please stay, and I will um, do it. You can email me the the rubrics too, in case anyone wants to see the anonymous rubrics after the fact. But today we really are focusing on the scoring so that we can announce first, second, and people's choice. Seventeen responses. says went wrong are other people not seeing the survey the poll Rachel said hers works and other people not work about someone outside of UNCG is it not working yeah let me I don't know why that would be a thing. Okay, well here is a so someone is it non UNCG people? I'm outside and it does it does work. Okay. Okay. So one a couple people are saying it doesn't work. 
it's not working for some people, I don't think I quite understand why it would work. Not work. Okay. Okay. What we're going to do is I'm going to send out a survey right now. I don't know why. I don't know if there's Teams people in this room, but dang, Teams has done me wrong today. Okay. Let me pull up this poll. Um, so take this in the chat. Um, it will ask you for a login so that people can't vote twice. Go.uncg.edu. Um, just log in to an email. It's still anonymous. And then that's how we'll do people's choice. Okay. I'm seeing responses come in through here. So we're now, so again. Don't mail. Uh, whoever just said I mailed, I will not count that. It's now this go link. Go.uncg.edu, www, people. That is what we will be using. Okay, if you put a vote in the chat, I will not count that. You need to go to the go link um, that I will drop in the chat again. Um, Pam, I um, wrote you a question about your scores because I'm seeing two scores per candidate. Um, Pam, can you hear me? Pam, I chatted you. Um, there's two scores per candidate, so which one am I taking? You can email me. Okay. Okay. Okay, Pam. I'm waiting on you. Okay, there you go. Okay, I have the winners, and I have the people's choice. So, last chance to vote. Bye, Mara. Okay, so here we go. I will start with people's choice, so get your vote in. So, Parth wins People's Choice for Evaluating Immune Cell-Based Approach for Breast Cancer Immunotherapy. The second place is Lindsay Jarvis for Differences in Nature Conversations Across Rural and Urban Children. Congratulations, Lindsay. And first place is also Parth, Desai, for evaluating immune cell-based approach for breast cancer immunotherapy. So congratulations to everyone. All of the candidates were great. It was a close race, but that is the map. <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, people who are raising their hands, you're welcome to say stuff in the chat. Um, congratulations again to all of our contestants. I really appreciate it. Um, I do want to note that this is the first time we've had these issues in teams. <laughs> we did do a preliminary round and it went fine, but even with these issues, it went fine. Um, so, um, so I don't, so someone said my chart had a different thing. These were rubric scores based on judging, not y'all. The people's choice is just the one category. So the first place gets people choice. The, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the order of that. And then the first place and second place is based on rubric judging from the finalist judges. So thank you, finalist judges. I know Mara had to go, but thank you, Mara. Uh, thank you again to our contestants. I'm sorry this went a little bit long, but it was worth it. I really appreciate everyone. Uh, 
And Lindsay and Parth, I will be in touch with how the money will hit your student accounts. And um, thanks again, everyone. Happy Friday. And I'll see you all soon. Bye. I'm ending this. See you soon.